And now, with Sound Investing, here's Paul Merriman. Well, how many times have I said this is going to be a special podcast? Well, this is not only a special podcast, but it's actually a start of a series of podcasts that happened because Chris Patterson, who's here with me, our director of research, was invited to speak at the Orange County AAII, that's the American Association of Individual Investors, at their uh, monthly, I think it is, a Saturday uh, a meeting and to speak for two hours, which anytime I get a chance to speak for two hours, I grab it. And he, and I and I watched it. I, I took the morning off uh, on June, uh, I'm sorry, would that be July 22nd, and watched him present about uh, the selection of best in class ETFs and uh, about investor behavior. Now I want to tell you, I, I'm I'm not I don't have a competitive bone in my body, uh, and unless somebody challenges me, and then I become very competitive. Well, Chris has never challenged me, but he did throw down the gauntlet. He threw the glove down. He had almost fifteen hundred people sign up for that presentation. And this may not sound uh, as as good as you would like it to be, but we're used to it. A lot of people at the last minute find something else to do. But he had about 650 people show up. I mean, that is a record uh, for the work that we've been doing. So, Chris, first of all, thank you for doing it. And what happened because of this presentation, and I thought it was a great presentation, what happened is we got buried with questions I really should say you got buried with questions and you couldn't answer them all. And so instead we decided, all right, we promised that we would respond if they had questions, but we don't want to do it one at a time. We want to share it with with all the people that follow our work. So today we're going to take on 16 of the approximate, what, 60 uh, questions, Chris? Isn't that about what we got? Actually, I think we got about a hundred, but when you get when you weed out the comments and you look for overlap between them, there's probably about sixty uh, and 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 there may even be a few of those we decide are simple enough or were covered in the presentation we don't want to speak to. but we it was a lot. And I always wondered, does that mean I did a poor job of explaining things? <laughs> so there were all these questions or uh, or did I just get people thinking and uh, maybe it brought up things they hadn't thought of before? You know, I would say there were some people who came to that presentation with these questions in mind. And since you did not address everything you know, uh, they took the chance to, to ask you. And so uh, I'm and I'm pleased, by the way, that you uh, share this time with me because you could have just picked up the, the microphone there and had recorded this on your own. So uh, I, I'm very excited. And and so I've got the, the, the questions here. Uh, I'm going to read them more or less word for word as they were asked. Uh, and what is not included in here, I want I want you to know, Chris all the uh, all of the kind comments about your work you just uh and and by the way i when i saw your outline your powerpoint i knew this was going to be a great piece so anyway enough of that well th- thanks for drumming up a crowd you you promoted it well i i think without your help it would have been a small group so much appreciated well, it, i'm happy with however we got there we got there and that's wonderful let me I've I've arranged these a bit to to be together so that we can kind of dig deep into the uh, concerns people have about bonds or about uh, um, diversification, et cetera. The first question I'm going to land on here, it says the analysis presented showed some allocations using short-term treasury bonds. Given that intermediate term bond index funds were devastated by recent interest rate hikes, should retirees be instead favoring short term bond funds? So, what's your response? 
You know, we're, we try to recommend things that are evergreen because we're trying to advise people to be buy and hold investors. And that means we don't change our recommendations based on recent market conditions. But the pain is real. And uh, it's, it's some of the worst pain we've seen historically for bonds. Last year was a really, really tough year. Now, we, in our history, never told people owning bonds, you'll never lose money. We, we, they, they come with some risk. There are times, especially when interest rates are going up, that that risk is high. We haven't experienced that for many, many years, which is part of the reason last year was such a surprise. Um, so I think for people, it is a little bit of a, a wake up call to say, you know, is your portfolio right sized for the risk tolerance you have? If you had our diversified portfolio of bonds, you know, as the bond part of your portfolio with stocks last year or, or equity funds, uh, they still acted as shock absorbers. They still reduced the volatility you would have seen if you'd been all stocks. Uh, but both of them went down and it was a tough year. It was a tough year. So I don't think people should change the bond part of their portfolio based on that one year of history. But I do think it's good for them to look at that piece of history and say, did it exceed my risk tolerance? Was I surprised by how much volatility I had signed up for? And if so, they have two choices. They could, if they wanted, decide to go with a more conservative bond portfolio, but they could also just step down the amount of equities in their overall portfolio and maintain the diversification that they've got in the bonds that we recommend. So uh, either way, you know, we don't change our recommendations for the bonds they should have. Now, in my presentation, I did use short-term bonds as an example of an asset that was the most different from stocks mm -hmm. and from small cap value. And that may have also helped trigger this question, but that was just a teaching example, not the portfolio we recommend. Well, and I think the portfolio we recommend, that's an important topic because when we recommend somebody find that combination of stocks and bonds, I happen to be, my wife and I are 50-50. And so we look at the fine-tuning table that we encourage everybody to look at to understand what is the risk of that combination of stocks and bonds. And we use in the stock portion a combination of big, small value growth, U.S. international. And so the, the idea is not how did bonds do or how did emerging markets do. I want to know, did it fall within the, the, the parameters that we said you would probably have to face along the way? And last year, while the stock market was down, um, I, I believe uh, something like the S&P 500 was down 18, 19 percent, if, if I recall. And and the the worldwide, the ultimate buy and hold strategy that has a little bit of everything, that 50-50 strategy was down about 10 percent. And so it, it did what it was supposed to do. But when you start looking at the pieces, yeah, what do you do with that when you see that something that you have in your mind has low volatility, all of a sudden has high volatility? Or what do you do with the S&P 500 when for 50 years it has a big rate of return, but the decade you own it, it loses 1% a year? What judgment do we bring to the table then? And as Chris said, it's, you know, it's the whole package that we're trying to help people get to. And I absolutely would applaud the idea. If if this risk is bothering you, uh, then maybe you should look at how much equities you have in the portfolio, because you know that could be just that could be down fifty percent, as we know. All right, let's look at number two. CDs seem to be very attractive right now. Is there an argument to be made for parking cash? in CDs. Now that's an interesting question. Go ahead, Chris. Yeah, the um, the opportunities right now in relatively low risk assets are tempting. Uh, they're, it, and we just went through this ourselves because we, we realized some gains to fund our annual expenses, which is what we do in retirement. And uh, we were trying to decide what do we do with that cash? 
And so we just went through looking at some of this. CDs pay a little over 5% today. Money market funds are paying just a little under 5%. Uh, and that's kind of an interesting comparison because the CD locks in the interest rate, but it also locks up your money. So that's that's a 10-month CD that pays a little over 5 The money market funds give you one-day liquidity, which is really nice, but they don't lock in the interest rate. So if interest rates come down, then you're going to be getting less paid out of those on your on your interest. Um, there's also government bonds, short-term government bonds that pay over 5%. That's how these other tools deliver the interest rates they do is by investing in government bonds. But as an individual, if you invest directly in those government bonds, there's a, a potential state tax benefit because you you save some tax on the interest that you would have paid on these other tools at a, at a state level. So you got a lot of choices. Um, and my wife and I, as we looked at this question, we went and we looked at Paul's Vanguard uh, monthly income fund, the one that, that we recommend on the website to to compare and see, well, how much volatility and and uh, you know gain has there been there? And I think it went down. Uh, actually, we can share that. I've got I've got it right here. Give me just a second, and I'll pull it up. Okay, so my wife and I went and we looked at this and we said, okay, well, what are our options? And um, there are three things in here. So the, the first portfolio is the Vanguard monthly income, which is this equal 25% in four different funds. There's a, a Vanguard short-term corporate bond, a Vanguard intermediate term corporate bond, a Vanguard Jenny May, which is kind of real estate related and a Vanguard high yield corporate. And then the second one on this chart is basically, um, it's SHV, it's an ETF, but it's similar to money market funds. And then the last one is the bond portfolio that we recommend overall for long term. And what you can see down here is that this history only goes back to 2012, 2013. So it's short, but what you see in here is that the reason people are asking these questions is that this long-term portfolio, which is portfolio three, has a return over the last five years that's close to the very, very safe thing you would have gotten in a money market fund. And ironically, the, the best return over that period of time has been your, uh, your monthly income, Vanguard portfolio. But look at the difference in volatility. The, the money market thing pretty much just goes up hmm. and the the long-term one goes up a little bit but up and down and this monthly income one went up and down a lot now if we inflation adjust it um it's it's a different picture because this the monthly income one actually is just a slight loss uh, at this um what are we about 10 years where both the more aggressive and the safer one are a more substantial loss so when we talked this through, and I think other people need to kind of think about it in a similar way, my wife was uncomfortable with the idea that the money we'd set aside for our next year of expenses would go up and down as much as, as either of these more aggressive strategies, either the monthly income or the long-term bond strategy. She wanted something as safe as the the five percent that we can get today, and something that it may go down over time. It may be four percent, maybe three percent, but just knowing, even though it may go down in its real purchasing power due to inflation, that the actual number wouldn't go down and it wouldn't fluctuate as much. So, so that's what we decided, and I could see a lot of people making the same decision today. But I think we're giving up in the long term the potential for greater return. Because when you endure the volatility, especially if interest rates start to come down, either of these other portfolios will likely outperform it, especially as the interest rate on this more conservative investment comes down, the money market fund will pay less in time. So, so I, that, was, that, that was my thinking on answering this question. But I had a question back for you, Paul. I'm wondering, between you and Zan, how are you guys doing with this Vanguard monthly income? Is it bothering you or her at all? 
well, uh, in terms of its volatility, or are you just riding it out and it's all fine and good? I don't use it. Oh, you don't use it? I don't use it. And I'll tell you where that portfolio came from. Uh, what we actually use in the long-term portfolio is the spread between the three government bond funds, okay? That's what we use in our buy and hold portfolio. We do not use the monthly income. But so what do you use? Yeah, I, I know. Yeah, okay. would... I know where yeah. you're going. So what the long-term one, you use our long-term recommendation. That makes sense. But what do you do for your short term? We put it into the corporate, high-grade corporate index, basically uh, at, at Vanguard for our one-year income. That that portfolio, the four funds, that was designed for people who were looking to get a higher interest rate, a, a flow of interest to, to, to live on. Uh, be, because those government bonds that we like it for stability don't pay as much in regular income. So this was meant to be a diversified portfolio for people who didn't care about the higher volatility of the bonds themselves, theoretically, but they did want to get more income. So we have a lot of people uh, okay. chosen knowing that they're getting into a more risky, for example, the Vanguard high yield bond fund in 2008 went down about 20%. Whereas our, our combination in our buy and hold portfolios went up about 7%. So it really is for, and, and, well, and I guess I should note, we're not looking for more income. We're looking at our account in terms of living off of it and going You're looking for months. capital preservation, aren't you? In A combination of capital preservation and reasonable growth. And, and so when I say we don't use it, I do recommend it, but, I, but we, that doesn't fill a need that we have. So what do you so so what fund do you put your uh, your short term money in? Well, it is the Vanguard Guard short term investment grade bond fund. Yeah, yeah, yeah. F S U X. All right, let's take a look at that then. Uh, we'll do that in spe uh, yeah. over here. And while you're doing that, Chris, I want to tell you what the what our belief is. We know we're going to get tagged from time to time with an interest rate situation that is not to our benefit. But we are taking out more money than we need to, to, than we need to live on. So we have decided that as, on an ongoing basis every year, that if we use the short-term uh, bond fund, we're going to get a little more volatility, but we're going to be rewarded for that for a return that will be higher in the long term. Now, my long term is getting shorter and shorter, <laughs> but but it doesn't change the belief that it's it's of all the places we're taking risk. I mean, I think about our holdings in the S and P five hundred or small cap value or emerging markets. This is this is considered almost riskless, and yet it isn't purely riskless. We are reaching a little bit, and what did you find? I really appreciate that last point you made. Um, when you look at the portfolio as a whole, uh, what you do with the the short term cash part of it that you have is it's going to be a small impact on the total for the vast majority of people. But it's a, potentially an emotional one because it's what you're living off of. It's it's what you're planning around. So what I did here is um, I went back and I I changed my uh, set. So the first fund now, portfolio one, is the fund that we believe you use for your short-term cash. Portfolio two is basically a money market fund. And portfolio three is this uh, um, Vanguard monthly income fund okay. uh, or or portfolio, I should say. So portfolio one, which is the one that you use, is right between the two. Yeah. Uh, the safest is the money market, or that could be short term, you know, very short term bonds uh, as well, or a CD. They're all going to be about the same as long as you use the right horizon, like 10 months on the CDs. 
Uh, the and then the most aggressive one up here is this monthly income, and uh, so very very interesting. You've got something that sits in between, and you're right; it gives you some growth potential, but not not a lot. But it also gives you some volatility. And this and in this brief brief history, the worst drawdown for this uh, portfolio one, which is your solution has been about 6%. So you're putting putting on an annual basis, kind of 6% chance that you lose cash, but in exchange in the long run, you're getting uh, this sort of 2% Kager, uh, 1.8 is what Portfolio Visualizer shows over this period of time. So yeah. And if I could add one thing, Chris, I mean, this is, this is what is so complex about how people think of their investments. We know we're taking out more money than we need, but a lot of that money goes to charity. And so the the conversation we had about this was, look, if we take a little more risk, we're going to be able to give away more. I mean, there's going to be a payoff for us because it wasn't about having more money to live on. We already had more than we needed. It was about what we gave yeah. And we felt we could take that risk for, for other people. And just as in our in our rest of our portfolio, I mean, I've got some money in a hedge fund that I started back in 1995. It isn't for me. It's for my kids. And so, again, it's this it's the reason sometimes people need an advisor and is to kind of think through what are all of the reasons you are what you are as a money person and tell us what it is you want it to do. And that's the fun of that, of being an advisor. The part that is hard and I don't have to do anymore is I say to somebody, I think you should put your, consider putting, let's say your, your, your cash need money for the next year into a particular fund that I have. But I've had it for a long time, and and they just got it, and it just went down. Well, as a teacher, nobody calls me and says, "Wait a minute, teach. You got we put it in there and it went down. What the heck is going on?" But when I was an advisor, believe me, I got those <laughs> phone calls, and it's a whole different life. So we're trying our best to give good advice, but it does not dig into the details of who each person might be. All right, thanks. Thanks for your comments. Number three, uh, I know you have advocated for using funds that include globally diversified equities, such as the Vanguard target date funds or the worldwide four fund strategy. I have family members that have said that only by investing in different currencies and buying equities and bonds in those other countries, are you really covered if the U.S. goes through a really terrible time? What do you think about that? Do you think buying an internationally diversified index fund, then in parens via a U.S. brokerage firm, covers the risks? So, you want to make any comments about currency risk and how you think of it? Yeah, I I think currency risk is part of it, but I think this is actually getting us something more fundamental. Fundamental because what I hear them saying, I, you know, if you want to buy investments in other countries where you actually purchase them in the other country in their currency, I, I first of all, I don't know how to do that. Uh, <laughs> You know, that would be a tricky thing. You know, when I'm traveling, I never go to a broker and say, hey, I'd like to open a, an account in your country and and buy using your currency. That that would be that would be not impossible, but it'd be tricky. And so I I think what I hear them saying is, you know, if civil war breaks out and and uh, all of our institutions are destroyed and uh and the U.S. dollar is no longer respected, the safest thing to do to hedge against that is to have a place you can move to in a different country where you have a nest egg. And I, I, I can't I can't argue with that. It just seems very, 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 very unlikely. And so on one on the one hand, yes, if you want to be if you want to have the ultimate protection you could go to those lengths and those extremes. 
But I, I think you can temper that with the thought that the vast majority of the powers that be in the United States are interested in preserving and propagating the system that we have and protecting it. Uh, you know, our, the, the, our political leaders, for the most part, are wealthy and invested. And so they, they don't want to see this system fail. Uh, more, more and more of our citizens, the vast majority of our citizens have a nest egg that is invested. Uh, they, they don't want to see this system fail. So I, I, I think that the overwhelming momentum is in the direction of trying to preserve the system. And you can get very inexpensive, convenient diversification just by owning U.S. funds that invest internationally. Does that protect you against Armageddon? No. But, uh, you know, Armageddon may mean that equities don't matter anymore anyway. Uh, but it does protect you against a decade of poor performance in the United States. It protects you against what we know is historically fairly common, uh, where, you know, there's a period of time internationally where things go well and, and they don't go as well in the United States. So I, I think it's the way I look at it is the, the, uh, the recommendations we make are cheap and relatively inexpensive insurance by if you test them historically. Well, and of course, those international funds, uh, in most cases, the ones that, that we recommend are not hedged uh, against currency diversification. So you actually, if the dollar declines in value, you could get a boost in your international returns. In fact, if you look at our returns over the last 53 years and go back to the early years, there was a period where that made a big difference. But over the entire period of time, whether you were diversified for currency risk or not, you came up with about the same return, which is what basically the academics tell us is that currency risk and managing it is not going to lead to a higher long-term return, but it should lead to less volatility. It should smooth the ride. So, when somebody says, will I be okay in the U.S. Uh, four-fund strategy or the two-fund S&P 500 small cap value? Yes, they're what, what you're talking about, Chris, the catastrophic event for our, for our society here. Could, it could happen. It, it, it's a long shot, but a lot of people believe we're on the path to it right now. But the, but the bottom line is, is that you will get exposure to the value and the large and the small, et cetera, with a plain four fund strategy uh, in, in the U.S. And the returns are virtually the same when you create it with four funds, half U.S., half international. So I'm not worried about the catastrophic downfall of our society. I don't know how to emotionally do, deal with that. If I really believe that was coming I, I, do we take advantage of the fact that my wife has the right to be a Swiss citizen? You know, that's not on my mind. I really like it here. But uh, I appreciate your comments. Number four, my wife and I are 70 and our portfolio is 75% in cash. Considering how extended the major markets are at this time, how should we begin to invest? Dollar cost average, they ask. Now, boy, when I read that, I just thought, oh my God, this is this is the very thing that we that we worry about. Uh, there's some reason they're sitting in 75% cash. I don't know what it is. As an advisor, you'd like to know that, but do you have a, a quick comment about uh, about their question? Yeah, the core. Th message, I think, in my presentation uh, was built around, uh, I don't know, everybody uh, listening will have seen it, but it was built around these pictures of two different kinds of birds, <laughs> right? Uh, you know, one one is a puffin that dives deep under the water. It can't really fly very well, but but it can dive really deep and it can catch fish while it's got fish in its mouth. And it's got these kind of special powers to be a really goofy, weird, different kind of bird. And the other one was a northern fulmar, which glides along the surface and picks up the fish that it can easily and it scavenges and, and it looks graceful like a bird, right? 
And, and my message was, you know, what kind of investor are you? You need to know yourself. And the kind of investors we're looking for are a little bit more like the puffin. They, you know, the ones that we're educated, if they're going to listen to podcasts like this and listen to me blather on for a couple hours on a Saturday, they're willing to learn and to, to learn that to get a different return, you have to exhibit different behavior and you have to tolerate tracking error and not just look like the S&P 500. So when I read this message, I think th th this person may not be well suited to exactly what we're advocating. And I, I feel for them because clearly there's probably been some market timing here. Um, and I don't know how to advise somebody to do that well. I, you know, the history suggests that uh, there's little evidence anybody can do it well. Even professionals are only a very, very small percentage of them if they can. And so um, I guess compassionately, I would I would try and say, you know, if dollar cost averaging is what it takes to get you back in the market. Yeah, let's let's go do dollar cost averaging uh, because you're not going to be able to time it perfectly. Um and I guess the one other thing I would say compassionately, just because it sounds like maybe this person needs more help or wants more voices, is go listen to Rob Berger's, uh, one of his most recent podcasts, because Rob actually looked at the science and the studies that look at dollar cost averaging into the market. And the only footnote I'll add to Rob's podcast is that um, there's very little history so he was looking at, does it make sense when the CAPE ratio is high to dollar cost average instead of lump sum into the market? And the problem with that kind of analysis is that the CAPE ratio has only rarely been as high as it is now or you know has been at the last peak. And so there's very, very little history on it. And if you were to look at the whole history, the academics would say, you'll make more if you lump sum, if you just go lump sum in. But there have been a few times where dollar cost averaging was better. And uh, the behavioral part of it's probably more important for this individual. If that gets him back in the market, get back in the market and then stay there. Please stay there. Don't jump out. <laughs> well, and have the right amount of fixed income. I yes. Mean, in, in, in a sense, uh, I, I, I would be a dollar cost average kind of person. Um, and, 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 and because I'm defensive and I, and I'm 50% in bonds, I have friends that are hundred percent in stocks still at my age and older are still a hundred percent in stocks. And boy, they, they are, we're, we are birds apart. Uh, and when I look at how they feel about their investments and so I, to be at 70 and not be sure what that next step should be, it's more than just getting in dollar cost versus lump sum, it's really also a big question. How much equity should you have in your portfolio? And it may be it's only 20%. And it may be at 20% to, to, to go in relatively quickly with a dollar cost average would be okay. But if it's going to be a huge part of the portfolio, it may be you should do it over two or three years. And to, to really think how aggressive you want to be Remembering it is always, sadly, easier to buy when the market is high than when the market is low. And we all know that intellectually that's backwards, but we also are humans. And that's, uh, that's how we tend to respond. All right, number five. Oh, I love this one. Uh, dimensional fund small cap value was 31 on June 2007 and is 42 now. Over 16 years, this is a yearly return of 1.9%. Can you comment on that? Well, my first response is, wait a minute, that's in my portfolio. Did, did I miss something? Um, go ahead, Chris, if you wanna take the first shot at it. And if not, I've got the numbers. Yeah, what do your numbers show? It actually, is that the correct? Uh return? It depends on how you look at the return. Do you include all the capital gains, all the distributions that they made? And well, and, and the, uh, yeah, the reinvestment of dividends. So what is the return with the reinvestment of dividends? 9.7% over the go. last 15 years. The reason I went with 15 instead of 16 
is because I go to Morningstar and that's updated every day. It is interesting to note that the average in that category over that same 15 years was 8.6. So I have welcomed the fund back into my portfolio when I found out that it hadn't come out at 1.9%. Uh, but it, it is an interesting aspect of mutual funds. They are obligated to, to distribute uh, and, and reinvest in most cases is what people ask them to do. So while the price didn't go up much, 1.9%, everything else totaled up to be uh, another, what is that, 8%, I guess, approximately. So you're looking at something, I can see it in your eyes. What are you seeing? Well, I'm just doing exactly what he did. So I'm going to Portfolio Visualizer and going, looking at the history from 2007, he said, right? June, if you want to be. Yeah. Oh, June of 2007. Okay. Let's look at exactly June of 2007. And we will reinvest dividends because that's what you should do. A lump sum back test. And uh, what, yeah, what we get is a CAGR of 6.85%. So uh, it's interesting, uh, you know, it, it, uh, that is not an impressive CAGR, I would say. Well, you know something? Uh, what happens is it means that you, the, the, the market started selling off the last part of 2007. You were picking up right from the top, if you will. And you're seeing what happened with the complete decline of 2008. Well, and I, I think in his mind, I think in, in behind this question, he's saying, you're showing me a fund that for 16 years of time delivered 6.85% compound annual growth rate. Now, he quoted the 1.9 because he didn't include uh, reinvesting dividends. Uh, but it was 9.06 for the S&P 500. And if I go back and I say don't reinvest dividends, which is the way he was looking at it, I think. Yeah, so there you go. Okay. DFA's small cap value, the compound annual growth rate over that period of time, not reinvesting dividends was 1.84%. And Vanguard was uh, the S&P 500 was 7.02. So. What I hear in here is that, A, this is an individual who cares more about the price of his asset than he does the total return. And, and maybe there is some fairness in that because there's taxes on some of those returns that reduces their value. Yeah. Uh, but the other thing I hear is that he's happy to make an investment decision on a particular 16-year period of time. And going back to my presentation, you really need to know what kind of an investor you are. Yeah. If you're going to be swayed by this analysis, I think it may well be the case that you should invest in the S&P 500 because it's it's got a higher price return. It's something he's probably comfortable with. It's the benchmark he's using. Uh, and I should say he or she, I don't know. Um, and and they will likely be happy with, with what they have as an alternative. And I tried to be really, really forthright in my presentation and say that what you and I recommend and what we teach and what we advocate, although it has historically delivered a better return per unit of risk, it's not for everyone. There are people for whom just a target date fund will be a better solution or just SP 500 or S&P 500 plus 10% in short-term bonds because they trust Warren Buffett. That's fine. <laughs> I have absolutely no problem with that. I, I think it's far more important that they do what fits them than that they do what is historically optimal because for most people, they'll stick with it. You know, they'll stick with what fits them. Yes, and and to give even greater, I mean, wider perspective to how people feel, the people who were sitting there on July 22nd uh, are comfortable with the idea of being in the market or wishing they were in the market in one case, okay? There were a lot of people who did not attend 
who have no interest in having any money at all in the market because they show another story that when you go into the market, you can lose a lot of money and more than you thought you were going to lose, at which point you cash in. They did it once. They're not going to do that again. They learned their lesson and they're never going back into the market. And we have the same problem with the S&P 500 going 10 years, making a compound rate of return of a negative 1%. What do you do with that in convincing people it's a great place to put their money? Well, the answer would be look to the long term. And when it's the S&P 500, I think it's easier for people to say, oh, yes, all those companies I drive by on the way to work, yes, I will know that I own part of those big companies. But when you say you should have money in small cap value, you don't drive by those companies as often. And so there's that peace of mind is what will allow people to put money into the S&P 500, even with bad performance, versus other asset classes they just don't know as well. So thanks for doing that work. Uh, number six, it seems that the underlying assumption of these long-term analyses is that your audience has a remaining lifespan long enough to linger in any specific strategy. I'm liking this comment. But probably most of this audience has already reached retirement age and are looking at a 30-year limit at best. Now, how many years? When you think about how long you're likely to live, legitimately, what, how do you, what do you put on your life as an estimate how many years you could be around? I think I've still got another 30 plus. Okay, yeah. that's great. So wouldn't active market timing, this is what he goes on to say, wouldn't active market timing be a better strategy for our category when it comes to tweaking asset overweights and underweights? Also. How might one use stop loss rules to to contribute to better returns? In other words, the bottom line is, why not be defensive and be a market timer as a as a way to deal with the reality that we have a relatively few years left? Yeah, there are two thoughts that come to mind here. One is that you're in this situation, Paul, and you have always used some systematic market timing managed for you, done by the Merriman. Uh, what's the name of your company? Your former my former company, Merriman Wealth Management. By Merriman Wealth Management, and they are one of the few companies I think that sells that systematic market timing as a service, as part of their wealth management offering. Uh, and so I don't I think you feel like that is a prudent solution to hire it out and have it done for you as as a way to uh, reduce your downside risk. It doesn't increase your upside risk or your expected return, but it does actually tamp down some volatility. So uh, I, I don't think there's a problem with that, except that it's not very widely available. And so people would maybe struggle to find where to get it. Uh, I don't I don't use it because I I haven't chosen to go with your former company. And I think I have the stomach to tolerate the volatility of the portfolio we've right sized it for. And the reason we don't recommend that as a strategy for do it yourselfers, you've said this many times, is that doing that kind of systematic implementation is very, very difficult on the emotions because so many times you you the trades don't help you out they they actually are losing trades and so it's easy to second guess it as you're going along unless you have a computer doing it for you in the background most even professionals uh would second guess it and so that's why for most do-it-yourselfers I, I don't think it makes sense uh to try and do that kind of systematic market timing um but there is some really good news from all of my experience uh, and looking at the, the evidence, the numbers, the compound rate of return over a long period of time with timing and buy and hold are virtually the same. Yeah, they're almost the same. I mean, and, and, and how, do you, how does that happen? 
Because if you have a 70% equity, 30% fixed income, timed account, you have about the same risk and about the same return as a 50-50 stock bond buy and hold. Timing reduces the risk. A lot of people think timing increases the risk. No, it reduces the risk because when you're out of the market, you're sitting patiently, hopefully, uh, in a money market fund or someplace that there is no volatility, uh, while the buy and holder is always exposed to the volatility of the market. Uh, and, and as Chris said, I would never try to do this myself. I'm very comfortable having somebody else do it. I'm very comfortable being able to know that my wife and I, we are half buy and hold, half market timing, half big, half small, half value, half. I mean, we are half of so many things, people can't believe that it doesn't add up to more than 100%. But it is massive diversification, and it's what I'm comfortable with. I don't have to be any more aggressive. In fact, in fact, Vanguard would tell me, if you look at their target date funds, that at our ages, we should be no more than 30% in equities and 70% in fixed income. And I'm feeling like a young buck. We're 50% in equities, being more aggressive because we're, uh, we're, we're investing for the next generation uh, in, in part. So, And the, the last part of this question about stop loss rules uh, is stop loss, uh, he's implying that you would set a trade that is going to sell a a stock or a fund when it drops below a certain level to protect yourself in your retirement years, to protect your nest egg. It's a complicated way to do the same thing that right sizing your risk in your portfolio does. You can just carry more bonds um, and you can, you can lower your downside risk in bad market times. And so I think Again, it's a personal thing, but for for the vast majority of people, I think it'll be easier to unemotionally implement a buy and hold strategy that's got the right size of risk rather than trying to do these complex solutions. And the downside of these comp complex solutions is that it's just far too tempting to fall into the wrong kind of market timing, which is performance chasing where you go, oh, wait a minute, this thing's going up. That's where I should be. And then sell the thing that hasn't been going up. You know, So today it would be maybe selling REITs because REITs are down to go get into uh, growth because growth is up. And usually that's exactly the opposite thing to do to maximize your return in the long run. Yeah. And, and, I, might, and I might add that uh, being almost 80, let's say I've got 15 years, well, 73 and 74 was a period where market timing could add value. Doesn't mean every market timing system will, but, but, but should or could uh, have value. You then had to wait until 1987. And while we were fortunate to have our clients out of the market during that major one-day decline of 22%, the biggest market timer in the country, a guy named, uh, uh, oh my God, uh, how embarrassing, I can't think of his name now. But um, he was in and got out on, on Monday after the huge decline. He was late, but that's because our systems were slightly different. And, and so when you look from that period of 73 and 74, with the exception of that one day huge decline, you have to go all the way to 2000 before you run into a need for market timing, which means that at, at age almost 80, I may not see a market that needs protection with market timing. In fact, there's a pretty good chance that I won't. But I mean, I probably will, but I might not. And so do I quit market timing? No. Do I quit putting money into the stock market because it might collapse? No. But I got enough fixed income in there that if it collapsed for many, many years, it would not keep us from putting bread on the table. All right. I know we're talking longer than we expected. So um, number seven, risk and reward of um, evaluated strategies. Where would the ultimate buy and hold strategy sit on the chart in terms of, 
of, of, of risk and return. Do you want to comment on that? The, the lowest return, lowest risk strategy, but a good one was the target date fund. And it was uh, a 47% uh, worse drawdown. And that happens during the accumulation years where you want it to. So the retirement years have less of a drawdown. It had a lifetime CAGR of about 5%. That's real. So that's above inflation. If your inflation across your lifetime averages 3%, that would have been an 8% return, quite respectable. And it had a safe withdrawal rate of almost 4% at 3.7. So it was good. Uh, the next strategy we looked at was two funds for life with a 90-10 split, 90% in the target date fund, 10% in small cap value. And it had a 4.1% safe withdrawal rate. So that's really nice. A 6.1% uh, lifetime CAGR, real again. So that's uh, before inflation. But to get the added return, you had to tolerate more risk. It, it took it up to a 54% worst case drawdown. Now, these worst case drawdowns uh, were going all the way back to 1928. They happened 0.1% of the time. So this is a very conservative way to portray risk. Many, many lifetimes did not include that worst case drawdown. Um, the 80-20 target date fund, small cap value to fund for life strategy improved the safe withdrawal rate to 6.8%, or I'm sorry, the uh, CAGR to 6.8% and the safe withdrawal rate to 4.5%, but it came with much more risk, almost a 70% worst case drawdown. Uh, and then up here at the top right, you have the highest risk strategies. These were around 80%. Uh, there's a group of three of them that are below, just below 80 to just above 80% worst case drawdowns. And they had CAGRs of 6.7% real. That was the S&P 500, which had a 3% safe withdrawal rate. And then the 50-50 two fund for life strategy, target date fund and small cap value, and worldwide four fund portfolios, both were around a 4% CAGR, both were around an 8%, uh, or I'm sorry, an 8% CAGR and a 4% safe withdrawal rate. So where would the ultimate buy and hold sit on this chart? It would be about the same spot as these two, about the same spot as the worldwide four fund and the 50-50 target date fund and small cap value split. I would expect it to have about a 4% safe withdrawal rate going back to 1928. And I would expect it to have about an 8% real CAGR. Now, Chris, I got to tell you, I, I, I struggle. I, I struggle with um, showing this information going back to 1928. By the way, I, I fully support it. I think it's, it, it is a full disclosure. But a lot of people are making decisions based on periods of time that that would not include these catastrophic events. And so let's say that they are they are trying to make a decision, and part of the information they're getting is from people who are showing the last 50 years instead of the last almost 100 years. And, and uh, so how different? Would it be if we pretended that 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 terrible decline back in the 1929 through 32 period didn't happen? That the government can now control things better uh, than they did in in the, in the past with with all sorts of kind of stimulants and whatnot to try to prop up a falling uh, economy? How if different you, would this look if you look just at since 1970, and I don't need to see the exact figures, but just kind of generally. Yeah, generally the, the drawdowns would probably be about two thirds of the the size and the safe withdrawal rates would probably be a, a half a percent or more greater. Uh, and that's one of the reasons I go back to 1928 is that all of the safe withdrawal research covers the 60s, which is where our safe withdrawal rates get set. That's where the worst experiences, the worst uh, retirement experiences began. So to leave those out uh, makes the safe withdrawal rate research or, or numbers un incredible. It makes them unbelievable because people 
have, <clears throat> have anchored on these numbers that came from the 60s. <clears throat> so I think another way to look at it, and I'm going to do this in my AAII article that's coming up in a couple of months where I talk about safe withdrawal rates, is to look at uh, what the likelihood is that you would live through one of these, you know, drawdowns at different time periods or, uh, or, or declines. And like I said, the likelihood of your experiencing the 80% drawdowns shown here is roughly 0.1% in, you know, in any given month. So that's a very, very tiny percent. The vast majority of the time, the most likely, likely outcome is that you're up because the markets tend to go up. Um, but in terms of trying to figure out what risk you should take on, I do like to be conservative. I'd rather have people right size their risk for something that is a little more extreme than, uh, well, I'd like them to believe that they're exposed to something maybe a little more extreme than what they're actually going to experience so they don't take on too much risk. And so, yes, it's conservative. Um, and yes, if you went back to 1970, it would be smaller. Okay. But but I, but I think that the, re, the relative returns would be, would be uh, similar. Yeah, the returns, the returns are quite consistent. They, they don't change that much. Um, I mean, they, they do go up and down, but the, when you average out over a lifetime or 30 years or 20 years, they become very, it, it gets much narrower. Yeah. Okay. By the way, I'm getting the feeling that rather than 16 questions today, we're going to get through 10. Uh, we'll see where we will. You tell me when to stop. <laughs> okay. The next one, number eight in a 401k, would it be better to pick an actively managed target date fund like T. Rowe Price for simplicity or pick a three fund boglehead strategy, even though it's slightly more complicated? What do you say? Uh, this is really up to the individual. It's really a, a personal choice. Neither of them seem complex to me. They, they both seem pretty easy. And I would encourage the person before they decide to consider a two fund solution rather than the three fund solution. I'd go in between and I would say, why not use a target date fund and some small cap value? Because then you get some of this more meaningful diversification. Uh, when you go you the the diversification you get with a small cap value fund is much more meaningful than the diversification you get going internationally so i i would encourage them to look at that but i think any of them are fine they they'd all be fine you get more control with the three fund boglehead strategy because you can decide how much you want in the us and how much you want internationally and how much you want in bonds versus stocks you know at a very granular level but uh, my personal favorite in there, I'd, I'd go with a, a target date fund. I'd rather use Vanguard than T. Rowe Price, although T. Rowe Price has outperformed in recent years. So, you know, the T. Rowe Price is, hasn't done poorly. Uh, but, um, yeah, I'd, I'd go with the, the small cap value combo with that. And I, and I guess as I look at the three fund strategy and remembering that I have to address these fine bogleheads, in uh, in October, and I and, and I'm I'm bringing my tomato protective uh, outfit to wear. Uh, I would probably be looking rather than at the total market U.S. and the total market international, which is what the three fund boglehead strategy is about, plus yep. a bond, a total bond market uh, um, portfolio. I would. Looking at the, in fact, I'm going to have a, a link here to, I believe it's table H1, where you can look at the S&P 500's return. There is no reason that I know that you would get a better return by having a combination of the S&P 500, of the uh, total market index U.S. and the total market index international. I think the S&P 500 itself will, will create almost the same return. What you would see is... You want to be a little more aggressive than what Chris has recommended here is that a combination, if you want to be a do it yourself investor, a combination of the S&P 500 and small cap value 50 50 
over the last 53 years has exposed people to less risk of loss than the S&P 500. And so that's what I would be trying to get people to look at and to look at every year. In fact, we'll also include the, the, the link to the all of the tables about these strategies. So you can look at every year at a time since 1970 and look at that risk and return. And, okay. and Paul, when you when you present that, I, I think it's your opportunity to help teach Bogleheads something that I think some of them don't understand. I, I, many of them probably do. But when you own the total market, I've heard them say, "Well, I own large, I own small, I own value, I own growth." I've, I, you know, I I'm exposed to all of these things. The growth offsets the value. The large offsets the small. The only way you get meaningful diversification is by owning a disproportionate amount, by owning more than is represented in the market at large. So when you combine the S&P 500 and a small cap value fund, you tilt, you own a disproportionate amount. And, and that's what gives you the benefit of taking advantage of one zigging when the other zagging and they're performing performing a little bit differently to get a higher return per unit of risk. So I, I wish you great success with the Bogleheads. <laughs> well, I will have that other table uh, with me that shows small cap value on one side of the page, the S&P 500 on the other, and making 10% incremental changes in the combination. So somebody could say, Hey, I like what Chris is suggesting, 10% or 20%, but oh, let's see what happens when it's 30% small cap value. And you're going to be shocked at how different, little difference there is in the risk and how much difference there is in the return, if only the future could look like the past. Number nine, instead of a bond fund, why not a dividend fund that invests in companies that grow their dividends? like the Schwab dividend, uh, uh, U.S. dividend ETF, S-C-H-D. Well, this one is an easy one, isn't it? Well, my, my dad was a dividend aristocrats investor, and I, I really understand the appeal of being able to pick companies that have a history of delivering increasing earnings and distributing it back to their shareholders. And for my father in retirement, there was great comfort in knowing that there was going to be a steady stream of money coming in that meant he didn't have to tap the principal. Mm -hmm. And so I understand the appeal, but uh, I want to read a little bit from Larry Swedro's book here, Your Complete Guide to Factor-Based Investing. And I don't know if Andrew Birkin or Larry wrote this, but Appendix C says dividends are not a factor. And I'll just, I'll just read a little bit here. In their 1961 paper, Dividend Policy Growth and the Valuation of Shares, Merton Miller and Franco Mog uh, Modigliani famously established that dividend policy should be irrelevant to stock returns. For more than 50 years, this theorem has not faced a challenge in the academic literature. Moreover, the empirical evidence supports the theory, which explains why there are no asset pricing models that include a dividend factor. Despite this long-held tenet of traditional financial theory, one of the biggest trends to occur in recent years has been a rush to invest in dividend strategies, such as strategies that invest in stocks with relatively high dividends or in stocks with a record of increasing dividends. The heightened interest in these strategies has been fueled by both by media hype and the current regime of historically low interest rates. The low yields generally available on safe bonds since the start of the Great Recession in 2008 has led many once conservative investors to shift their allocation from safe bonds to riskier dividend pay paying stocks. This has been especially true for those who take an income or cash flow approach to investing as opposed to a total return approach, which we believe is the right one. And then he goes on to say that um, it, you know, there's just no evidence that dividends uh, are a path to greater long-term total returns and that you should really focus on total returns. And the truth is, when you get a dividend, your stock price goes down by that amount. And you can you can watch it day to day. You know, somebody sends you a $2 check in the mail, you think, I got $2. 
well, your stock price went down by two dollars. <laughs> so, um, you know, it's there's no magic there, and dividends are a forced tax, is the way I look at it. Um, so, I, I can see where it appeals. I don't think it's an imprudent strategy. I just don't think it's the best the best approach. And um, so, we take a total return approach, both in the way we construct our portfolios and and the way we invest personally. And the bottom line is that the bonds have a certain, a, a small amount of downside risk, uh, larger than people ex- expected last year. We understand that. But built into that Schwab fund is the 50% loss in a big market decline. It is, it is uh, not a widely, broadly diversified. It has 100 companies uh, and I believe 40 uh, of the or 10 of the company, 10 companies represent 40% uh, of, the, of, of the portfolio value. So it, it doesn't have huge diversification that you would get in the S&P 500. But the key is it's not a defensive, except that, that, if, that if that dividend keeps coming, that's the reward that allows you to see the value go down by 50% because you believe that the companies are going to come back. And uh, anyway, thanks for reading that. And as as most of the people that follow our work know, we have a list of truth tellers uh, that do not pay us to call them truth tellers. And Larry Swedpro is 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 one of them. So uh, God, this one's way too easy. Um, I'm, I'm going to give you. I'm going to skip one here and go to number. What is? We'll make it number ten here, Chris. Oh, let's just take number 10 and do it as a bonus. It was super easy. It was how long a period of time is your short-term bonds? It was 12-month U.S. Treasury bills. So there you go. That was easy. (laughs) Oh, okay. Very good. Uh, By the way, um, the the short-term bond fund that I use uh, has a maturity of about two years. So it's a it's a slightly different uh, animal in terms of risk and return. Okay, that's number ten. Number eleven. If my four hundred one k doesn't have a small cap value fund, could I use a small cap blend as a substitute for the two funds for life strategy? Uh, and the answer is uh, yes. And to use a cooking analogy, it's weaker sauce, so you might use more of it. Uh, I would look at it carefully, and hopefully it's a small cap blend fund that avoids the growth part of the market, because the small the small caps small cap value has the highest historical returns, but small cap growth is a dog. So you really want to uh, have a fund that filters on some kind of financial metric like profitability to try and avoid those overly hyped, too expensive small caps. Um, but if you get a good small cap blend fund um, that does kind of tilt, at least in that direction of better financial performance and maybe even nudge in the direction of value, you might use more of it to compensate for it not being a small cap value fund. And historically, when we look at all the 40 year periods, large cap value has almost the same return as small cap blend. So that's another alternative. Yeah. And and again, it's it's weaker sauce, but, uh, you know, use a little more. So, okay, I'm going to push to number 12 here. Then. Um, how, because this is all you here. How does Portfolio Visualizer work on target date funds? Well, it, it back tests them fine. Um, it You can use it to figure out, to kind of use the look inside using the factor regression. The problem is that with target date funds, if it's in the years where they're shifting their allocation, so not the 2060, 2065 funds, their allocation is very stable. But if it's say a 2030 fund where it's ramping ramping down the equities and ramping up the, the bonds, well, when you, when you run a back test on it, you're gonna see that glide path in action. And when you run a factor regression on it to look inside the fund, that's what I recommended in my paper to try and figure out what you're getting. Uh, you're going to get a mix of things. Some of it's going to be the last year's allocation. Some of it's going to be five years before. So uh, it you just got to be careful in in understanding what you get out of using Portfolio Visualizer on it. You can still do it, but 
pros and pros and cons. It's a little harder. Yeah. Um, you know, 13, I'm, I'm pushing, I'm pushing here. Yeah, yeah, keep pushing. <laughs> 13 says one of your charts showed a 33 times real return, but an 81% drawdown risk. Uh, and then he goes on to say that means $100,000 could turn into 33.3 million and then decline back down to 627,000. Does that seem right by multiplying the different scenarios? And the answer is yes, um, but that's extremely rare and uh, perhaps even impossibly unlikely because what you're doing is you're saying, I got the average Kager. So that means I'm at a point where the market valuation is probably in the middle. It's not, not a peak. And then I get the worst decline, which usually happens from a peak. So I, I would say that that's an overly conservative analysis. If you've gotten the average return, you're probably not going to see the absolute worst case, case decline at that point in time. So, so yes, he did the math right. No, that I, I would say that that's an, an extremely over conservative view of it. But if you're invested in a portfolio that has a downside risk of 50%, 60%, 80%, whatever it is, and you're approaching retirement, I think in your mind, that is what's what's on your mind, right? It's I, I've invested in a way that I'm exposed to losing half my money. What if my nest egg becomes half as large? Can I still afford to retire? And um, you, know, you, you do have to think that way because as long as you bear the risk, the risk is there. And as long as you're trying to earn the, reti- the return that bearing the risk provides, that risk is there. Got it. Thank you. Number 14, what is the investment factor? You said dividends are not a factor, but what yep. is this factor that you talk so much about? So I, I should say, first of all, there are many different market models that are equally valid for characterizing the market. I just chose to use one of the Fama French five-factor models that included this term investment factor. It's also called CMA or conservative minus aggressive. And it's the difference between the returns on, on a diversified portfolio of stocks of low and high investment firms. So a high investment firm would be aggressive, a low investment firm would be conservative. Um, and so it, that's what it is. There's a momentum factor I could have used. There's, or a model that includes momentum. There's uh, an investment factor that was in here as well. I, I don't really care so much which of these models I use because I've found that when I use, I've done the analysis with multiple models the same funds bubble to the top. The thing I like about the Fama French models is that they have the longest history. And so that lets me go the farthest back in time. Yeah, but uh, yeah, that's that's what it means. And so the market itself is a factor, right? Yes, yes. And and it's the biggest factor. Yes. Uh, and, and, and so uh, what is going to drive the long-term return most for young people. In about an hour, I'm going to be talking to 60 nurses who are graduating from uh, Texas A&M. And so they're looking at, at facing these huge decisions. But the factor of, well, first, of course, they're saving versus spending. But when we decide to invest, there's stocks and there's bonds. And that market factor is going to be the key factor in terms of what they will receive over the long term, right? Yeah, and in, that's a really good point because when I do my analysis, the market, the size, and the value are the things that drive most of the return. And then either the investment factor and the uh, profitability factor or the momentum factor and uh I think profitability is in that one as well, or quality. Uh, th- those those factors are like tiebreakers. You know, it's great if I can get a fund that has consistent exposure to five factors instead of four at low expense ratio. That's better. That's better. But really, what we're looking for, because they're widely available and cost effective, is that market factor, the size, and the value. Those three things drive 
90 plus percent of the return. And the other things are just, you know, an extra three to 5% here and there. Yeah. Okay. And number 15, what if you were to differentiate by market sectors instead of Fama French factors? Well, this it, it, the academics would tell you that market sectors like technology or oil and gas or or energy are they're idiosyncratic risks, and they're not um, it, they're not systematic things that we can say. Well, for the next hundred years, oil and gas is going to be the winner. It probably won't be. Or for the next hundred years, technology as we define it today will be the winner. Uh, so in a sense, you're, you're taking on a risk you're not getting compensated for. And the most extreme example of that would be investing in a single company, having an, a, an entire portfolio of one company. You're either going to be a hero, average, or a zero, right? And you don't know. You don't, you don't know the outcome. And you don't get any compensation for that. You just take on that whole risk. And so industry sectors are not as extreme as a whole company, but there's still idiosyncratic risk you're not getting compensated for. And what the academic would say is that you can diversify that risk away and you'd be better off focusing on the things they do identify as factors and having a portfolio that includes them like small or like value. And what you'll see over time is that value will occasionally include technology, uh, financials, in energy, oil, and gas, it, it, there'll be all kinds of sectors that go in and out of out of value, but that it's owning the value part that is giving you the best return per unit of risk. So that's that's why it's just idiosyncratic risk and um, not worth not a risk worth taking. Yeah, I think you hit that one out of the park. I love that answer. That's great. I mean, I think that'll help a lot of the people who follow your work. I've, I've been nervous about asking you this very last question of the day. I mean, I actually have. Oh, I know the answer to this. I one. have butterflies. It says here, Chris, by the way, a lot of people, when they wrote these questions, they started Chris because you gave the presentation and I'm just, I'm, I'm just hanging on here to your success. Chris, would you consider creating a factor regression video course? So a do it yourself investor could learn how to judge funds for themselves. What are you thinking? Probably not. <laughs> oh, okay. okay, no, that's, you know. And, I'm, and the reason, there's reason. a reason. The, the reason is I feel like I've already taught somebody who is going to be able to take advantage of this information and do it themselves, everything they need to know. It's very simple. Uh, the the presentation I just did explains the math and it's super simple. You take, you know, it's this number times that number plus this number times that number, add them across minus that number. And that gives you an indicator of future return. That's it. And and you can go to the portfolio visualizer and download all of the data and build a spreadsheet. And that's all you need to do, really. I I to do a course. We, you know, or, or to go deeper would be a course. You'd have to go into statistics and teach people about, you know, how to how to know what statistical significance was. And the people who are asking this question, I don't think have the stomach for it. I don't think they have the stomach for the course. So I think most people who have the inclination and math skills to do this kind of analysis got what they needed out of my presentation. They'd be able to look at it and go, oh, that's pretty simple. Oh, here's the Excel table. I can do this and they'd be off and running. And the people who can't do that would need so much more information that um, I think they'd get off the train. I think they'd be partway into the into the course and they'd go, oh my gosh, this is just way more complicated than I thought it was. <laughs> and they'd say, they'd step off the train. So that's- I don't have to yeah. hear you answer because I was I was afraid you were going to say yes. <laughs> Where is it going to find the time for that? Hey, what about would they get anything more out of Larry's book? Uh, they, they, I think they would. I, I okay. think people who are in that in between would potentially get something out of Larry's book because he does a very nice job of uh, going through and explaining uh, in lay terms 
how these factors uh, have been identified, why some are factors and why they're not, how why we should believe in them persisting in the future, which I think is really important. I, I think, again, the book we're talking about is your complete guide to factor-based investing, Larry Swedrow and Andrew, uh, Andrew uh, L. Birkin. Really good book. I've, as you, and you can tell, you see the, see the post-its? Yeah, that's good. <laughs> it's, no. it's dog-eared and thumbnailed. And yeah, I mean, it's-, yeah, it's, it's I like that. We will have a link to that book. And yeah. by the way, when people buy that book at Amazon and they go to Amazon through our link, I think we get a dollar for the, <laughs> for the foundation. So yeah, uh, yeah. your dollars are appreciated. So. Uh, Chris, congratulations on the presentation. Thank you for taking this time. Uh, I have, I don't want to call this bad news, but but uh, Chris is going to be uh, off doing other things for a few weeks. And we got a whole bunch more questions uh, to, to do here. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to record several more of these, but I'm going to leave all of them that I know that they really want to hear from you until you get back, and then uh, we'll do this again, okay? Well, as always, Paul, it's a great pleasure. It's super fun. And I got to thank our uh, the audience you were able to drum up for generating what I thought was a really rich and fun set of questions. That I, I, I love the question and answer part because it's where we get to learn and interact, learn from our students and interact with our students and figure out where they are and try to meet them there. So hopefully this is useful to people. And uh, I, I also loved this presentation doing it because I got to put some of my heart and soul in it. I got to put some, uh, some of the pictures from our recent travel in there. And I love doing photography. So uh, oh, maybe, maybe that's a tease for people who haven't seen it. You get to see some beautiful Iceland. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, it's been wonderful, Chris. Thanks. And we'll uh, uh, see you in, uh, in, in, in a few weeks. What, three yep. weeks? Yep. Gone for about three weeks. All right. Keep safe. You too. I am so embarrassed. No, no, no. Don't be embarrassed. Just, All right. just, just be, be grateful. You learned something new. That's a good day, right? <laughs> oh, my. That was Paul Merriman with Sound Investing. Sound Investing, soundinvesting.com, and paulmerriman.com are produced and exclusively owned by Paul Merriman, who is solely responsible for their content. For more information, free articles, mutual fund recommendations, and more, visit paulmerriman.com.